everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Top 10 Show. I am John Roca. Uh, I am Matt Nost, and we are excited to be here another week doing the Top 10 and uh, patron chosen topic today, uh, which is uh, comedic actors in serious roles. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to it. Should be a lot of fun. Our thanks to uh, our patrons once again coming up with great topics, and we look forward to it each and every time because it's just a it leads to all kinds of interesting and different, uh, you know, conversations. Absolutely. Those are the things that, and these are the, one of the perks you get if you're a patron at the uh, $50 and above level, you can select a topic, your boss hog patron. That's the you get to select the topic. We've been doing one a month for quite some time now. So you will get your list. You will get to choose it. So if you go to patreon.com slash the top 10, go in there and sign up. If you got that 50 bucks to, to support the show every month and look, we're bringing you so much content every month on the top 10 topic thunder. We just had the golden ticket. We're starting to do live shows now for our patrons at the $10 and above level. We're doing those. So those are all starting to happen here as we give more perks out to our patrons. So if you want to be able to pick a topic, it's at the $50 boss hog level up there, go and do that. And then you, maybe you get your name mentioned. We'll read your list. We'll debate your topic. You will basically run the show. So that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, that's yeah, it. and we do the live shows. The Well, our plan is to do them the second and fourth uh, weeks of the month. Yeah. So they'll come out the, the following week. But uh, so if you're a patron, please just join us over there. The chat was a boatload of fun last time. So we're looking forward to it uh, going forward. Hopefully yeah. we've already had a few people say that they've kind of uh, tailored into their schedule for work. So they are taking off you know, those <laughs> weeks. Well, just the time they're scheduling the hour and a half, two hours that we do the show. Yeah. Uh, each and every time. So looking forward to it. Hopefully we'll have some regulars, you know, yeah. it'll turn into cheers. <laughs> Norm. Yeah. There you go. Uh, a show that I could not get Catherine into tried to really, she just, I don't know. Didn't find it funny in those, the first few episodes of season one. She's like, ah, I don't feel like this. I'm like, all right, fair enough. What's well, a good, uh, place to start at, man. What, what is your, I mean, we're going to kibitz here for a few minutes, but what's your feeling now? They just announced Frazier's coming back. Uh, yeah, I heard about that. Party down is apparently coming back. Do we, nah. are we hitting the wall of like shows coming back? for a season or two are, are, are do we i feel like we're coming to the end of this trend do you like it well it's easier for something like party down because their budget has to be so low mm -hmm. i mean they a lot of the primary locations were just houses around los angeles because they were caterers right so whatever it costs to rent a house and then you have the production crew and whatnot but it's lower so Although I just don't, is there a demand for that show? That's I liked what I was it. wondering about. Adam Scott tweeted about it. Said, We're coming back. But you know what's ironic is since that show went off the air, how many of those people have blown up to the fact where you could actually shoot an episode in their actual houses uh, because they've gotten some nice uh, chunk of change for the work they're doing. No way yeah. Jane Lynch is getting paid show to show on Weakest Link. That's that's a good chunk of change on the primetime uh, game show for sure. Uh, and Adam Scott's been you know booking stuff left and right that, that the Parks and Rec money wasn't nothing yeah. i'm sure so and the other was it lizzie cooperman was that yeah, the lizzie other? kaplan yeah lizzie kaplan. kaplan right right she's been working and then megan Mullally came in and took over for jane lynch when she left right right uh but i also think it's like jane lynch is doing the game show but that pays so well it kind of frees her up to do this is like a fun project type yeah. of thing right good point yeah, yeah, so yeah. maybe they all come in for the same like oh we're all getting paid the exact same type of yeah. thing we're all gonna have some fun yeah, yeah. Exactly. Good point. take a couple of weeks shoot a show and in this never-ending churn of streaming shows and it's just another streaming show i'll be intrigued as to whether or not people find it this time yeah what's the apex though on this man is seinfeld the apex all four of them are still around would you want to see a seinfeld seinfeld reunion show i well the problem is or i think season? so there's a uh a, a reaction video to uh from years ago it's like five years ago mm -hmm. or something but this is five years ago where young like teenagers 15 16 17 18 in that ballpark watched episodes of seinfeld and then reacted <laughs> to it but they're all like you couldn't do this today that's inappropriate oh right etc 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 and it's just like i don't know if the humor is would be allowed to come to fruition like it did in the past yeah where they could find their rhythm type of thing that'd be you know 
Although there are great parody accounts of uh, Seinfeld in the pandemic. Seinfeld. <laughs> really? Yeah, pandemic. Like I saw somebody tweet it out and be like, oh, okay, so <laughs> the episode is um, Kramer doesn't get the stimulus check because <laughs> he doesn't qualify financially because he makes too much money. So Jerry and George set about trying to find out where, wh how much Kramer makes, like what his yeah. value or income is and where he's making it from. And then Elaine had a side story of uh, Putty wasn't willing to take the vaccine or something along those lines. <laughs> and I was like, that's a, that's a fun show. And yeah. I've, I've seen other parody accounts of like, they rattle off, it's like, oh, that's good. There's there's a lot to this. Um, I keep waiting for Curb to come back and do their season with COVID. Because that's mm -hmm. going to be just brilliant. There's so much to play with there. You know, I, I stopped like watching it. Curb a long time ago. Really? Okay. Yeah. I like it. I have nothing against it. I, I guess it just, yeah. when it came back out, it was, I don't know, watching other things or something. The last season, this last season was excellent, excellent, excellent. Really? Yeah. I was surprised how good it was because usually when comedy seasons get to be like the ninth or tenth, you're like, you guys are just hanging on at this point. But I guess because he takes those long breaks in between the seasons, he's really honing the scripts uh, and taking his time, making sure they're good before he does them. So it was really good. I think that, yeah, you, you probably would never get a Seinfeld, Seinfeld reunion one because they brought by what Roseanne, which of course became the Connors. Frazier's coming back, as we said. They probably could never wow. do a Cheers because Kirstie has no way they bring Kirstie on the set. Well, exactly. And I was about to say, uh, Richards is kind of oh, right, right. But that was little. so long ago. Don't you think we've, don't you think we kind of forgiven him, or do you think it was so far out there that like, because he's been on a Mia Culpa tour ever since, man. He is just exactly. so. But like, what else has destroyed. he been in since? Well, then? that's why, because nobody wants to cast him, and he's probably just like exactly. Sucks. Whereas, and Julia's had a wildly mm. successful career since. True. Um, True. So yeah, uh, Richards and Seinfeld. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, I I'd be know. intrigued if Seinfeld would still play the straight man because that's what he plays on that show. In essence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the ladies, man, he'd probably still be single. So it might almost be yeah. kind of pathetic to see him in his 40s or 50s if he's single, still trying to go out there and date if Elaine is single. Like, it could be kind of, I'm sure it's right for comedy, but really at their expense in, in a way, uh, possibly. So who knows? But who knows? Maybe they discover a new way because so many people, you know, get divorced later in life. What's it like to get back out in the dating scene? I'm sure there's a lot of, weird great stories about dating in your 50s and 40s and 60s maybe they can mess around with that yeah quite possibly i don't know i, yeah, I don't see that one coming back though yeah and a lot of the others that you'd love to see come back i don't know if they have the budget i don't know if mm. the story needs to continue right um you know like all time shows since you brought up you know, seinfeld yeah they'll never redo game of thrones just too expensive right right uh breaking bad it's complete i don't know well, they, what you would they already did el camino yep they did the movie um deadwood they did the movie that's done yep. the wire there's oh, everybody's no. aged out i don't know how you would do you know guys in their 40s now trying to act like they're running the streets in the streets <laughs> of the young man's game it's like yeah. ah, i'm not buying that i think they could recast the entire thing and just do it all over yeah or just do a different story it's possible they brought back veronica mars yeah i never watched that show yeah it's interesting there are a number of them i mean like i said we already did. so there's no need to go and, and look through that one but there's just i wonder if there's any that are out there that people would love to see again i know pushing daisies but that one that's more about a matter it got canceled too early I don't want to go with ones that got canceled too early. I want to go with ones that like went to their end, natural end, and now people like bring them back. You know? Well, I mean, <clears throat> did Party Down really go to its end? It just it was on Stars. It ran for a couple seasons. I didn't find it until after it was gone. Okay. Uh, just had a number of people recommend it, say it was good, and it was. What about Scrubs? Couldn't they come back as doctors? Yeah. Instead of. 
uh, you know, uh, getting their hours, doctors, they could come back. Sure. Yeah, I could see that. Hmm. Plus, I don't think any of them have gone on to stratospheric levels where they couldn't afford to do it again. Right, right. And they actually have a podcast, um, Zach Braff and, and Faison. Faison. They do together, yeah. You know. uh, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's kind of akin to every office actor now has a podcast <laughs> about the office. Like it's, That's true, yeah. It's amazing the cottage industry that has spun off of that one show. Yeah. People uh, love that show, dude. Like, oh, I think I've, I've watched it fully twice and then gone wow. back for a couple episodes here and there. Really? Okay. Yeah, I think it's it's a tremendous amount of quality in there. Yeah. Uh, I think it was the last season that fucked me up, so I just don't go back and watch it because I'm like, it still ends at that last season. Once Steve leaves, I think the show takes yeah. a precipitous decline. Yeah. Um. So, I don't know yeah. if I go back. Like, if I were to rewatch it a third time, I might just skip that after he leaves. And right. be like, I'm good. It's like um, when Glover left the uh, Community; it just never was as good. Hmm. Yeah, I couldn't get into that show. Oh yeah, that's right. We've talked about that. Yeah, I don't know. It just wasn't my, wasn't my cup of tea. Well, Brooklyn Nine Nine or is this about to end. Oh, is it? It's about yeah. to end. Yeah, they're doing one more season, and then that's it. So, yeah, I don't know what else. Yeah, mom, mom got canceled. So it's interesting. I wonder what they would want to bring back. Interesting. I'll, I'll just throw it out there because, like, there's so many that are coming back. Man, it just kind of occurred to me that we've kind of hit some kind of wall. Yeah, here where enough is enough already. Although you could do a Cheers to bring it back. Around Ted Danson does a lot of TV. Yeah, Woody Harrelson would be probably the toughest get, and then I don't know what you do with Shelley and Kirsty. I think you can bring back Shelley. You wouldn't be able For to sure. bring back Kirsty. I don't think. But would oh, Shelley do it? Yeah. Like yeah. by all accounts, she wasn't pleasant to work with. Right. Um. So would that tune have changed all these years later? Uh, look, I know they kicked around bringing back NYPD Blue. There was the they were kicking around the idea of bringing it back about a year ago or two years ago, and they were gonna do it as Andy's son, like the young kid he had with Charlotte Ross. Okay, I think that's who he had this. Oh no, maybe it was yeah, I think it was Charlotte Ross. And now he's becoming a detective, and the first case he solves is the murder of his father. So they're gonna kill off Dennis Franz in the pilot. And I was like, What the fuck? Like this guy hasn't been through enough shit, you're gonna kill him off, you know. Yeah, but Dennis Franz is how old at this point? Like, I don't know. How how can he? He's too old to be a cop, and it's a cop show, right? So what else are you gonna do? Why not have him swoop in every once in a while, but not like be a a regular, not like Jerry Stiller, like having like hanging but, out. I don't know. I, I can understand why they would want to because it's more compelling that way. It's crazy, dude. He hasn't done shit. Since the end of NYPD Blue. According to IMDb, he hasn't done anything since 2005, which is NYP, the end of NYPD Blue. How the fuck is that possible? Is it's, he not wanting to act? It has to be. Well, 100%. It's a 100% choice. There's no reason in the world. Yeah. If you're on television for that long, you get offered television mm -hmm. for a long time. Um. And when a show is that wildly successful, too, it's like you're part of the formula that made that a success. Right, right. I mean, uh, yeah, so I, that has to be by choice. You just, yeah, I'm good. Oh, yeah. No. He, he Here it is. He retired from acting to focus on his private life. He told the New York Post he would be interested in turning active given the right opportunity. But uh, him and his wife spend their summers at their lake home in northern Idaho. Wow. Huh. Mm. I don't know where I was thinking, but I wasn't thinking Northern Idaho. I'm sure it's lovely. <laughs> well, it's it's, just, it's space and yeah, I'm you know, mountain ranges yeah. and it's beautiful up in Idaho, but right. I wouldn't have guessed of all the things. Fuck man, I, I 
Bring my kid my PD blue, man. Do you think he started his own chapter of like the Oath Keepers or something up there? <laughs> no, I don't think he's one of those guys. He, hey, like, he's got his own militia of some kind. <laughs> he was very socially conscious, man. I really wouldn't believe that Dennis would have one of those. Although, you know, I never know what happens to people when they get older. They start to become more cranky, more frustrated with the youth. They forget how they were once young and once fighting for causes and what have you and they all of a sudden switch to the other side and become just as adamant well, and crazy they fought for their cause and their cause you know that was settled so now they want things to stay status quo <laughs> exactly don't no, stop changing things stop, don't go after my dr seuss <laughs> well, it's basically it's a, yeah it's things were better in my day how dare you type of thing every the yeah, world you, was a yeah but matt you gotta have perspective like you were once that, so you have to create space for the youth to be that because, yes, you were that stupid. You were that idealistic. You were that willing to run into walls for the things you believe in. So create space to let that exist and don't be such a yeah. crotchety old fuck, even though sometimes I'm that as well. But I'm just saying. Yeah, the Dr. Seuss they referenced, I've never read any of those. Bro, so I didn't know. No one owns those books, man. They're like the way down on the rung of titles I had, for Dr. Seuss. Yeah, I'd heard of the one on Mulberry Street or whatever, because I think yeah. this was his first. Yeah. But I've never read any of those. It's Cat in the Hat and Green Eggs and Ham yeah. and Horton Hears a Who. And but I understand what they're saying. It's, it's Well, it's like the first thing I thought of once I saw, uh, you know, pictures of mm. some of the panels was like, oh, this reminds me of Disney's propaganda during World War II. It's like, yeah, go look at the way he animated Asian people. You tell me that's not racist oh, as yeah. fuck. Go watch some of those old Looney Tunes and see how they animated Asian people. Holy shit, man. Yeah. 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 And then, uh, you know, if you want to believe other people, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but, but mm. Walt may or may not be, may have been anti-Semitic. Yeah. There are rumors. Certainly. Yeah. Then just like, uh, but we're not canceling. Disney is a, you know, how many billion dollar enterprise. Yeah. Uh, but I agree. It's like, I, I liked when, Looney Tunes put out their stuff and like they put to, they had Whoopi Goldberg go on before and be like, listen, we're not going to try and hide the fact that this happened. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Here's an explanation as to why this happened. Yeah. And we still, I still, I love the fact that they still presented it. It's just like, yes, we need to, it's like the, the racist with free speech. I want to hear you be racist because now I know you're a racist. Right. Right. Uh, well, so it's good to acknowledge the errors of our past. Exactly. There's nothing wrong with that. That's how you progress. Just like you as a human being recognize some of the mistakes you made in your teens or 20s or 30s mm -hmm. and you vow not to make them again. You've grown from them. That's the game. But like looking back on them or or or, or calling them out is not a negative. It's it's the history. It's a history lesson for yourself. Um, TCM is coming out with a new, they just announced it today, a new program called Reframed Classics where they go back and revisit some of these more difficult films to talk about them and have intelligent discussion around the issues of the film. I think it's fucking brilliant. Yeah, as opposed to being like, no! And be like, yeah. we have to understand why your reaction to this is no. Yeah, exactly. We need to explore the topic so we can, you know, emotionally come to an understanding as to why it is, why it was. Right. And, uh... Yeah, I mean it's crazy. There there were articles coming out because all the Britney Spears, Spears stuff about a reexamination of how she and other pop stars of the era were talked mm -hmm. about, and other uh, other young stars. And there was a Rolling Stones uh, writer, might have been editor mm -hmm. now, but he wrote like one of the big pieces right when she turned eighteen, and it was a a like a discussion of things you would never in a million years think we're okay to talk about now yeah yeah it's funny just, yeah just like oh yeah the first thing we talked about were her you know her breasts mm -hmm. you're like what dude she's 18 she, dog yeah she yeah. just turned 18 but it's like yeah i remember that. i remember the you know all kinds of random things when you look back on it and be like man well, that definitely happened yeah and that was just 20 years ago even yeah. though it feels like it was five years ago but this is how we get better as a society that's why i think it's so you know, we're not going to get too deep into it, but this is what frustrates me sometimes. Is this is how we get better. We have to look at the things we've done in the past and, and just adjust them and change them. No one's, it's not canceling. It's, and I love someone commented, someone quoted a consequences culture, and I, I like that. That means, hey, this happened, and so there's consequences to it, or this was written, so we're asking you to look it up. You know, I, I 
uh, not to spoil anything about, but I watched that Allen versus Pharaoh documentary, and you know, you, you forget how so many people resisted that for so so long, and then over the last two years, how many of these actresses and actors came out in support of Dylan Farrow, who made the accusations as a seven year old child about what happened, and you're like, okay, so people progressed, people changed, mm -hmm. you know, people learned and people opened up and heard, and so. I think that's not a negative. That's that's the progression of things, the evolution of things. Yeah. Um, and yeah, does it sometimes go to like the Mr. and Mrs. Potato Head? Sure, but that doesn't affect my life. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it, yeah, that's it, it. Doesn't affect anybody's life really. It's just something to get upset about. But like, exactly, they're saying we we're trying to eliminate we're trying to eliminate this sort of gender designation. And okay, let's see what that leads to. Maybe we'll get happier kids. Maybe we'll get kids that don't have to end up in a uh, therapist chair at the high numbers that they're ending up with over the last two decades, three decades. Yeah, maybe that at least, but you know, but is it going that too one far? To me maybe, is, maybe. It's a, I think it's dumb argument on both sides. I think it's dumb all around. Okay. Uh, and it's not what this show is about. I don't really want to. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's kind of get into it. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, I think both sides are being idiots. <laughs> there you it's go. a nothing subject and why are we having you know i understand what you're saying but at the same time it's like you're i don't know this seems like yeah. a fight because you like to fight it's fair and then the other side it seems like a fight because you like to fight and it's <laughs> they're never going to find common ground and they're just yeah. going to yell at each other and in two weeks it's going to be something completely different oh. but it's the same argument it's always something completely different. Comes yeah, it's just like, okay, way. we've moved on to this, and you're both just going to yell at each other, and there's no resolution to this, and the yelling is just going to continue. Yeah. I don't know. I tune a lot of it out because it, it's there's a lot to take in these days. Well, it's, it's not yelling to compromise. No. Right? It's yelling to... To say shame. I'm right and you're wrong. Right, exactly. To shame or to devalue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it's just like, well, telling somebody that they're wrong is never going to get them to change. Right, right. And Having a conversation might. Be. Yes, being adult about it and having a discussion as to why you feel these ways right. can, you know, mm -hmm. help you come to some understanding of the other side's point and find common ground. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to just saying, fuck you. Exactly. It's like, uh, yeah, it's just, it's frustrating on both accounts. Even if I side with a certain individual, it's just like, hey, you're, you're doing this in an inflammatory way. <laughs> it makes it hard for me to side with you because I don't like this as a form of discourse. Right. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. It sucks. Yeah. But that's not what the show is about. As Matt nope. said eloquently, the show is about uh, top 10 comedic. Oh, sorry. Dramatic performances by comedic actors. Uh, and this is going to be very interesting because interesting you can take comedic actors in so many different directions, Matt. Do you think standard? Do you think stand-up comedic actors? Do you think sketch comedy comedic actors? Do you think started mm -hmm. out in their career doing mostly comedy and then made the transition into drama? There's a lot of ways you can play this, uh, but I tried to focus very much on people who were known and got known for being mostly comedians, then took a chance to do a dramatic uh, role. Okay. But that's my definition, right? And that's that doesn't mean that's your definition, but that's how I. I tried to approach it. Yeah, I, I I did the same thing because there are certain people that have feet in both drama and comedy. That yeah. For, you know, in my estimation, for the duration of their career. Mm -hmm. So when they segue into drama, it's like, we've seen them do this before and then they go back into comedy. Right. Uh, and then there are others where I know them as dramatic but like in their way, way past, they did comedy. I've right. never saw any of those. So I've always thought of them as uh, dramatic actors or yeah. leaning dramatic. So I excluded those. And I tried to uh, wait for the size of the part. Hmm. So if it's That's a smaller, yeah, it's a smaller part. Be like, it was a great, I'm not taking anything away from it. But we saw these other comedians like do so much more in these other movies. That's fair. Totally fair. Uh, but it's a long list. It is, I was surprised. Like once I got past twenty, I'm like, "Ah, oh, this is longer than I thought." So that's a good thing. Yeah, but but I have an down. entire, literally an entire page. Yeah, of typed out options. So there's, I had to. That's why I was like, "All right, I need larger parts." I think there might be one or possibly two on my list that have small, mm. but they're small. Like they're second or third. 
you know, lead type of thing. Okay. Whereas there are others like part of an ensemble and it's a comedic actor doing a dramatic role and be like, that was awesome, but it's, it's a smaller part. So it's easy right. right now because this list is so long, I have to create some sort of criteria by which I'm going to winnow it down. Yeah. So th that's what I just started doing. Uh, yeah. But there's tons. There's so many. I'm like, man, he was so good in that. And what other dramas has he really done? Yeah. Or she was awesome in this, but the part was so tiny. No. And just kind of moved down the line. <laughs> yeah. Um there's a couple that I hadn't seen going through this because I just started to open up people's IMDBs, like just typing in oh, comedic yeah. actors and then just going through and then, you know, typing over my, my document. Yeah. Okay. This, this, or this type of thing. And then moving on. Uh, there's a few that I haven't seen. Oh, wow. It, okay. Yeah. May or may not be on your list. Uh, so we hopefully they see. are. We shall see. And there's one that's definitely going to be on your list that I need to revisit. Okay. Um, but you guessing my list already. Well, I already know. I already know. Okay. Oh, oh, oh okay. All For right. a fact. And I would guess top three to four. Uh, maybe we'll see. We'll see. Um, all right. Uh, Matt, why don't you tell them how the show works? I'm going to dump out for just, uh, 45 sure. seconds, please. Uh, once we set a topic or today came from our patron, David Mitchell Baker. Thank you, sir, for sending an excellent uh, topic. We go our separate ways and create individual top 10 lists. Come back here. I do my bottom three. He does his bottom three. I do my next two. He does his next two. Then we trade one apiece. Once we have both revealed our personal top 10 lists, we create the shows between the two of us. That's all you need to know right there. There it is. Bam. How you like that? Um. So how is everybody out there? Looking forward to another week of Top 10 Show. Uh, I'm good, you know, getting through, getting through, gearing up for potentially, hypothetically, in two and a half months or so, I'll get uh, my first vaccine shot. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, could be only uh, three months out and I'm inoculated. We should be about two months, two and a half months away before we get our vaccine, buddy. Yeah, yeah, I know. I saw that. Uh, cause I'm not going to go there and wait at those centers at 5 AM in the morning until 6 PM or 7 PM for the extras. No offense. Dan. It's not a game I want to play. And if you want to play, knock yourself out and do that. Yeah. I'll not. wait till they call me. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's it might fine. be a little bit easier down here in San Diego. I don't know. So we're going to find out at some point for sure in the next uh, week or so, if we can get in to get vaccinated. My mom just got her first one. So uh, hopefully so my parents. Second one next week. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's yeah, cool. yeah, they get theirs uh, next Friday, I think it is. Nice. Their their booster shot. Yeah, that uh, one's supposed to be worse. The second shot is the rumor, but I don't know. Yeah, then well, then they're going to get in the car and drive to go visit some uh, family. Oh, so I, good luck to you. Hopefully, it's not bad because <laughs> they didn't feel they felt diddly on the first one. They were expecting like you know yeah. having some sort of, uh, but nothing. But uh, so that's all I've heard as well is the second one is the one that gets you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I am ready. And <laughs> it's, uh, let's get it going. But anyway, so yes, that's how the show works. And we're doing um, dramatic roles from comedic actors or comedic actors in dramatic roles, however you want to say it. Yeah. And once again, thank you to David Mitchell Baker. And we will get to his uh, list at the end of the show. And uh, so I'll just jump right in. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, once again. Tons of choices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think nine and 10 were the hardest for me to fill. Oh, absolutely. Uh, just because there were so many. So I just said, fuck it. And eventually just co copy and pasted this one, which was uh, Steve Coogan and uh, Stan and Ollie. Oh, good choice. Nice. I like that one. Um, yeah, it's there are like a couple comedic moments in it as they're doing their act, so to yeah. speak. But it's really a drama about these two individuals having been together for so long and they separate at one point and they're coming kind of back together uh, for one last go of it. And he carries the years and the sorrow of what transpired both him and John, John C. Riley. They're both excellent in it. Um, but I just, I know Steve Coogan primarily as a comedic actor. Yeah. I've, everything I can think of off the top of my head outside of this movie. I know that he's been in other dramas, but it's always comedies, whether it's a, our trip to this 
or mm, right, right. Uh, Hamlet two, or <laughs> yeah. like the guy has been working steadily for a long time and crossed over here too. Yeah, Tropic Thunder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Night at the Museum. Right. Um, but I mean, if you don't know him, if you Google searched him, you see the image, you're like, oh yeah, I know Steve Coogan. Yeah. Um, and I like Stan and Ollie a lot. It's kind of one of those where. It came out. It had some award season buzz. Never really uh, got anywhere to it, but I saw it after that and uh, really enjoyed it thoroughly. It is. It was deserving of the praise that it got, in my opinion. Plus, it's an exploration of a duo that I don't really know all that much about. Mm, okay, I know yeah, more yeah. about the Stooges and more about Laurel and Hardy uh, than I do. Maybe even the Marx Brothers too. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was. It was cool for that aspect and also to kind of see old Hollywood, the old uh, studio mm -hmm. systems and what really drove them apart and the contracts that they had. And eventually, you know, uh, the, the parting of the ways as one chooses, Ollie chooses to, to go on and continue making pictures for the, the company that they work for and Stan yeah. saying, no, that's not, it's not what we should do. We should be owning our own and, making yeah. money, you know, the real way and the division that created between the two of them. But I just found that really interesting character exploration. Yeah, certainly. And the wives getting involved and, mm -hmm. and what have you, but great. And, and look, normally you'd see someone in a, in a fat suit and start to be like, uh, but it really works with John C. Riley and what he portrays. Yeah. Uh, with, uh, uh, Ollie, with Oliver, you know, it, he really kind of nails it. And could, again, the Stan Laurel thing could be played for caricature. And he really brings uh, a great depth to what he's portraying there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really sense from them their friendship and their camaraderie. Um, but And like any duo, they're going to battle. But what they come out at the end kind of savoring and appreciating about each other and about how effective they're, they're, they are together as opposed to apart. It's, it's really powerful to see that. And yeah. he, does, he does a great job. You're absolutely right. Him and Riley do a really great job. Um, all right. So that was my 10. Yep. And once again, 50 other choices. <laughs> it was impossible. And I just chose that one. I was like, ah, he oh. was a, he was a, it's a larger part. It's him and John C. Riley, but he is by default, I would say the one a, because yeah. it focuses on, you know, him a little yep. bit more. Uh, so nine, I've got uh, Melissa McCarthy. And can you ever forgive me? Oh, uh, that's a punt. Okay. That's a punt. Yeah. So which um, my number eight is Eddie Murphy and Dreamgirls. Oh, that's my seventh. So let's talk about it. Okay. It's the, one of the smaller, if not the smallest role. Yeah. But it's an hour of the movie. He's in the first hour of the movie. Yeah. So you see his journey in those 60 minutes. And they're damn incredible. And he was nominated for the Best Supporting Actor uh, Oscar. And a lot of people felt he was the odds-on favorite to win it. And then Arkin swung in there and got it. But he is great as Jimmy Early. Was that the Argo year? No, uh, Little Miss Sunshine year. Oh, little wow, that was Little Miss Sunshine year. Yeah, God, dude, even less of a reason to give him that fucking Oscar. That's a bias against Murphy, man, because he yeah. deserved that Oscar for. There's nothing Arkin did Little Miss Sunshine. He hadn't done 35 other fucking movies, man. He was frustrated to see him lose that Oscar. Yeah, I thought about Arkin in another movie, but I was like, dude, his part is so small. <laughs> right. It doesn't really. Uh, and he also, at this point, like he is more comedic, but yeah. we've seen him in a bunch of dramas. So I was like, ah, I don't know if I, uh, but Eddie Murphy is stellar mm -hmm. St outside of Jennifer Hudson. Like the two of them just blow the doors off of oh yeah, bringing those characters to life. Yeah. But I mean, he was, it, it's one of those, the resurgence that he's gotten since then. It's been fully deserved, and that's why I'm kind of holding out hope, even though now coming to America is not getting good reviews as of it's, right now. Yeah, it's it's fine for what it is, and it's like Bill and Ted 3 level fine. Okay. So if you have nostalgia for these characters, it's fun to see Eddie again. It's fun to see Arsenio. Uh, see, I don't want that. Yeah, that's that's what you get, though, man. It's not it's not anywhere near the first film. Nowhere near the first film. I mean, I didn't think it was ever going to be near the first film, but... yeah. It worth the journey to go back. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was hoping for. Um, which also then means like if they're gonna do Beverly Hills, another Beverly Hills cop, yeah. It's like, ah, fuck. <laughs> that I was also holding out hope for that. Oh, if this is good, 
then I can continue my high hopes for right. this over here. Right. But between like uh, Dream Girls and uh, My Name is Dolomite. Yeah. And I didn't see Mr. Church. Was that any good? No, really wasn't. Not okay. his fault. I thought he did a nice job. The movie itself, though, was uh, just um, overdone cheese in terms of emotional beats and emotional uh, interactions in the movie. So, um, hmm. yeah, it's crazy to think that he lost. I mean, Little Miss Sunshine had a bunch of momentum, though. Yeah, it did, and that's and yeah, but I also think the bias against comedic actors, plus Eddie's black, hmm. and it was a almost all white voting body uh, at that time. Um, I don't think it would happen today. I think he'd absolutely win today, but that's how it was back then, you know? And so, which is what, 2010, I think Dream Girls is. So, yeah, something along those lines. That's why I yeah. thought it was the Argo year because it seems even a little bit closer than 2010. Oh, my God. 2006 is Dream yeah. Girls. Holy shit. Yeah, I think wow. Argo is closer to what is Argo? 2014? Yeah, Argo. 20... Is... Or goes 2012. 2012. There you go. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's 2012. Yeah, dude. Jesus. <laughs> nine years ago. That was nine years ago. I mean, technically not until the end of this year when it came out, but still. Sure, man. Whatever you need to tell yourself. Dude. Yeah, exactly. It was nine <laughs> fucking years ago. Nine years. Um. Yeah, but look, I mean, like Eddie, when he starts out, that's a to me, that's my favorite musical number. Okay. In the whole show. I know the showstopper is Jen, and that's just untouchable. That's a showstopper. But the rest of the musical numbers, that Jimmy Early number is fucking great. Uh, Fake Your Way to the Top is just brilliant. And then you see progressively how he goes from being the alpha dog to being the forgotten one. And then mm -hmm. that moment when he just breaks, when he's at that live special and drops his pants and then just the way they close on him, you're just like, fuck, man, that's heartbreaking. And the look on his face, man. That I'm every actor who's been at the top and, and has to kind of go down at the bottom or has to lose whatever status he, he or she was at, they know that moment. And he he put it out there. I was just was so blown away by it, man. Yeah. I would love to see him get more dramatic roles like that, but it's been 15 years and that sadly hasn't come i have to assume that's by his choice like he's turning down projects yeah maybe i have to there's because he still has such a pool a pull rather oh, yeah on oh yeah so many different people but matt he seems like watching that comedians and he seems like he's a comedian's cars getting coffee he seems like he's happy just being a fucking dad and just being around his family and you know that's it's hopefully that's the case yeah yeah he seems like he's so chill, just doing what he's doing. But uh, maybe if someone writes the right role, as we saw in Dolomite, he's great in Dolomite, um, we get like one last final hurrah of Eddie that leads to a, to an Oscar. You never know. Yeah. Although, I mean, when people were saying that he deserved to be nominated for that and whatnot, I thought it was good. I didn't think it was that good. It's nothing against him. I just thought the movie as a whole was like, ah, oh, it was fun. It was entertaining. Yeah. Um. But it's also nice to see that he could still put out a character with that much depth and warmth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, true. Yeah. All right. So that was my number eight. Okay. So then my number 10, I know you talk about size of roles. I really didn't look at that. It was more a matter of like, is this what I want to put on my list? You know what I'm sure. saying? And so uh, my number 10 is uh, Jerry Lewis in The King of Comedy. Uh, that is a punt. Oh, ho, ho! shout out to you, Matt Nost. All right. Yeah, I said one or two small roles. I appreciate yes. that. Buddy. I'm happy you have it on your list. All right. Um, my number nine then is Albert Brooks in Drive. Too small. I wanted to. I got three Albert Brooks roles written down. Yeah, it's great. He's an intimidating son of a bitch in that movie. That's why I put it over broadcast news. Look, broadcast news is a drama. It doesn't have. A couple of funny moments or a few. Yes, but it's a drama. And his character at times is played for laughs. Yes. But he's also a son of a bitch in that movie to Holly Hunter at a number of critical moments. So you could I could have chosen that. Sure. But that seems in his wheelhouse. Him playing a scary fucking villain like he does and making that turn mm -hmm. in drive, that's what put it over the edge for me. And that's not something I ever expected to see 
from Albert Brooks and ever expected him to do so goddamn well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I, I put it on my list because like I have to give it respect uh, for what he was able to accomplish. And it oh, yeah. works all the way through when okay. he shows up on screen, um, especially when he's killing homie's friend or homie's associate, uh, uh, Ryan Gosling's. I think it's Cranston. Uh, Cranston. Cranston. Yeah. Cranston. Yeah. yeah. Like that mechanic. moment. Oh my God. That moment with Jabs, he was like, oh, like, it's just, that's just business. It means nothing to yeah. him. And that's a color I never saw coming from Albert Brooks. I'm nice. blown away by that. He had a, a physical presence in that that I've never seen him carry. He walked right? in. He just looked like he looked like a somewhat realistic version of Kingpin. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He it's had just, the bald head. And he had yeah. The, uh, even his forearms were big, Matt. You're like, what are yeah, you fucking lifting? Just yeah. huge. Yeah. I trust me. I wanted to put it on. I had that. I had broadcast news and I had taxi driver. Oh, right. Taxi driver. Forget but about him and taxi his driver. part is so small. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then in broadcast news, I felt like I would say because his screen time is so a lot smaller than Hertz in Hunters, right, right. And then half of that screen time was for comedic effect, right. So I was like, ah, it's, he's doing both in that movie. Right. Drive was the only one in real contention because uh, it is so atypical. It's a great choice. Yeah, and and he's not um. Yeah, it's limited screen time, but it's memorable. And that's, that's it is. It's impactful. Of, yeah. Yeah. I just I chose that as a way to cut down and I made totally in essence two exceptions. All right. So then my number eight is uh, Will Farrell in Stranger Than Fiction. Uh I wanted to, I did not. Okay. All right, fair. I love this movie. And I've seen this movie of of all his films, this might be the one I've seen the third most behind uh, Ricky Bobby and or Talladega Nights and Anchorman. This film just, he's just so stellar in this film and it's sweet and it's touching and it's real. Yeah. Um, and uh, it is a drama because it's a guy confronting the failures of his life or confronting his fears about his life and having to negotiate that with Maggie Gyllenhaal with Queen Latifah while Emma Thompson is, is like narrating the narrator. His life. Yeah. Yeah. Dustin Hoffman. So, so much of this film uh, is a surprise to see Will play a character that's so touching and vulnerable and real. Uh, and there are shades of it that if you've ever been through that in your life, you will connect to certain sections of the movie um, when you see him negotiate it. And uh, he's just, so, you, you understand like that's probably actually the will ferrell where the other stuff is fun for comedy whatever but that that guy in stranger than fiction is actually who you'd know if you mm. were actually know him in real life and i i really enjoyed that uh and what he was able to bring to it because certainly didn't expect it from the guy who did ricky bobby or, no. or what have you and all the crazy snl sketches so i was blown away by that yeah I th that and everything must go oh yeah that's a good one too it is it's a even more reality ground based as opposed to stranger the fiction walking around with a narrator you know yeah. describing things to you as they're happening or about to happen right uh yeah i don't it's a it's a tough list and i just mm -hmm. i opted to, to not but it's an excellent choice uh he is awesome in it of those two i i would have chosen stranger than fiction and mm -hmm. the weird thing is if you look it up um it's got okay reviews which i find weird Right, but for Strength of the Fiction. Yes, I yeah. agree with you. And I wonder if people went in not wanting to accept him playing this character and watched it. They didn't create space to be impressed by what he was able to do. Because I can't think of any other reason why you wouldn't like the film or him yeah, in the film. The only thing I can recall is I remember the trailer when it came out and it seemed mm -hmm. more comedic than the movie is. Oh, so maybe people felt bamboozled a bit. Yeah, they might have gone in assuming it was going to be a comedy with heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's really more of a drama. Yeah. That makes it's got sense. some comedic moments in it as he freaks out because of the narrator and everything that's going on. Right, right. But yeah, it's more of a drama. But yeah, it's, I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was good. Yeah. Uh, all right. So what's your seven, man? Uh, my seven is uh, Jamie Foxx and Collateral. Oh, good choice. Shit, I didn't even think about that. It's okay. It still wouldn't make my list, but all right. All right, go ahead. I mean, once again, Jamie Foxx, you could say Ray. I could. I I, I didn't want to put it on the list because I'm like, how many times do I actually go back and watch exactly. Ray? And there's not that many times. So, and there's nothing against his performance. Obviously, he always won the Oscar. It just doesn't 
make me want to go back. Whereas Precisely. I've probably seen Collateral more than than Ray. Yeah, uh, and uh, Django Unchained. Oh yeah, Django and great. Uh, Just Mercy, mm-hmm. and like there were a number of choices. I chose Collateral because I will watch it the most, and I think it was the first time I ever saw him do any real full on serious acting. Um, and yeah, you know, we've talked about Collateral a number of times. It's awesome, and it it he has the right. He plays it so perfectly opposite Tom Cruise. Yeah. Like every time he feels scared and whatnot, it it seems like the natural reaction within that scene and very grounded and something that all of us can identify with. Because sometimes, you know, you're rooting for someone like Vincent. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in this one, it's, it, you know, the anti-hero doesn't really hold and you're, at least I was, mm-hmm. siding with Jamie Foxx like when he's trying to sabotage the night and whatnot. Uh, and get away, and we he's honking the horn, and those dudes come up, and they you know try to rob him and all that jazz, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, just over and over and over again. I, it was a siding with him, and it's a testament to creating a character that was uh, that was real and palpable, and somebody that uh, we could kind of put ourselves in that individual's shoes. Mm-hmm. And having never seen Jamie Foxx really do anything like that, yeah, uh, was thoroughly impressed because. Mm-hmm. He did to me, I'd have to go look at his IMDb, but I want to say everything I visualize him, it was kind of over the top comedic before that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to have a, such a subtle, more subtle, uh, you know, uh, character and representation on film, I was mm-hmm. thoroughly impressed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Certainly. That was the moment you're like, wow, this is a, something that Jamie Foxx can do. Cause I think Collateral came out before Ray. So he, he I was think a, so. Was I can look sample. it up real quick. Yeah, it was a sample of what he could do. And then of course Ray kind of was just so such a shock. And so yeah, but him and him and Cruz both playing, you know, uh types of characters that they wouldn't normally play, were just doing great work together in that film. Um overall. And yeah, Jamie Foxx does a good job in that thing. Let's see. Yeah, collaterals same year, but it came out before Ray. Yep, I remember that very distinctly. Yeah, so everything before. Okay, well, he had that small role in Ali. Oh, right. Is Bundini Brown? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, well, Bait and Any Given Sunday, but Any Given Sunday I didn't enjoy at the time. I think I like that more now. Yeah, no. But like it's Booty Call, Great White <laughs> Hype. Uh, you know, I remember him on In Living Color. So it was like, uh, I was. That was my choice. Anyway. Yeah, yeah totally. Totally. Um, okay. All right, so my six is the punt from earlier with Jerry Lewis. Okay. Because just for, I didn't see King of Comedy until I was, mo- you know, way older. This came out before I was born. Yeah, I think 82 or something. Like oh, no. Was it 82? I thought it was like 77. Was it 82? If it's 82, then I was three. Going on four uh, when this came out. King of Comedy is eighty two. Yes, eighty two. Nice once in a while, I get one right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So everything I knew about Jerry Lewis was Jerry Lewis. You know, mm-hmm. just the over the top. What he gets, you know, Professor Frank in The Simpsons. That to me was Jerry Lewis. Yeah. Uh, and that's all I knew him as. And then that, and you know, the the specials mm-hmm. at uh, Memorial Day for the telethon. That's yeah. that's what I knew as Jerry Lewis, but to see it all these years later and playing someone that's very more than likely very close to who Jerry Lewis was. Yeah. Was, yeah, I think you're right there, man. Yeah. <laughs> Super interesting. <laughs> Cause then it's like uh you, you find out about like the the rows that he had with Dean Martin mm-hmm. and the the nasty divorce that they had and then i knew about before i knew about that i knew about them coming together on the telethon because frank brought them back together yeah right that was a huge deal i remember yeah i one of those things of they played it on a clip one year and then i kind of had to be explained or it had to be explained to me who i knew frank sinatra was right right. and i knew who jerry lewis was i don't think i knew who dean martin was at the time Mm -hmm. um but it so to see what Jerry may have been actually closer to who Jerry was. <laughs> yeah. Super interesting. Super interesting. Uh, but the, the weird thing is, 
as much as he comes off as a prick, it's understandable the whole time. Yeah. And just the weird fascination and, and gravity that he has to people like Rupert Pupkin and oh, Sandra yeah. Bernhardt's character. And you could also say Sandra Bernhardt on this list if you wanted right. to. Oh, you could. Yeah, absolutely. In this movie. Sure. Yeah. That's um, absolutely a great point. But at the same time, like, th wasn't this her very first thing? Kind of, yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, acting? Yeah. Let me see. Let me see. It's a great. Because uh, I, I also wanted to try and get people that comedically we knew as actors before, not right. just they were stand ups and then segued into. Yeah. Uh, oh, I just see. thought of you have two on your list that I don't have is my guess. Now she was, yeah, she had done a film called Nice Dreams, which I don't think anyone had heard of. She'd been on the Richard Pryor show as like various guests, yeah, yeah, sketch kind of right. Oh, shit. So, okay. nice Dreams is the Cheech and Chong film. I totally forgot about that. Film. Jesus Christ. Oh, I've yeah. seen Nice Dreams. <laughs> is, is uh, nice nice Dreams is the one with the ice cream truck, right? I think so. Because up in which one's up in smoke? Then I think up in smoke is the ice cream truck. Is that is that the ice cream truck one? No, no, you're right. Ice cream truck disguised as ice cream vendors. There you go. Cheech and Chong make and subsequently lose millions of dollars selling a batch of marijuana with an unusual side effect. Yeah, there you go. God, it's been so long since I've seen those, <laughs> and I've never seen Corsican Brothers all the way through. Why don't they put this wheel slice on the Schmodown where they're talking about representation? Give me because there's only Chong three slice. fucking Cheech and Chong movies, man. Uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> I've met Tommy Chong, really nice guy, him and his wife. Nice people. That's what I've heard too. Man. I haven't met Cheech Marin, but uh, well, technically for a very like brief, but Tommy I hung oh. out with and got to shoot the shit with for a while. Was it a stand-up set or like in the green room or something? Yeah, no, it was no, no. right when I first started working at the store and uh, he came through and him and his wife. And then I was working there when Cheech and Chong did their first shows together since they broke up. Yeah. Um. So they were basically going to, they were getting the band back together. So they did their first weekend run of shows at the La Jolla Comedy Store. Mm, that's cool. Um, but Tommy, I took to to press and went to a bunch of TV and radio stations with. So we were hanging out in the car oh, and went cool. got coffee and yeah, shot the shit all morning and super nice guy. Cheech. I only met when, cause Tommy came down before him and then uh, they came down together to do it. And uh, I, I talked to him very briefly, Yeah, but they didn't, uh, if memory serves, they didn't do any press cause it sold out long before. So they didn't have to. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. That's okay. Yeah, it is pre-sold. Pre-sold is a good thing. <laughs> But it was all bits that you, if you listen to their comedy records and all that jazz, you knew them. Yeah. 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 Uh, which makes sense. Yeah. All right. So that was, so yeah. And uh, for me, it was seeing the, once again, the menace of Jerry Lewis, right? In this mm -hmm. film, the, the way he talks down to Pumpkin, the way he handles stuff in a calm fashion. You're like, it really is one of the most eye opening things in life. I remember very distinctly when I saw this movie because I was like, wait is this guy is this what he's really like because i saw it later in life as well matt i hadn't seen anything else of him yeah i'd seen the telethons but he always play the game at times you know and you figure yeah. well he's talking that low because it's late at night he's been doing it for 24 fucking hours or 72 hours yeah so it makes sense um but like watching him in this movie that's when you go how can this guy be the bellboy or bellhop whatever that film is called and these other goofy part you're just like how can this be the same guy and like, that's what was my first wake up call to how certain comedians are that uh oh, they I, could be quite standoffish or really i would say any famous yeah performer like that okay all right i don't think it's comedy specific i think you know okay I'm not saying that there aren't a bunch of comics like that, but I'm just saying because regular performers, you see them do stuff on film and TV, you know, like, okay. But like comedians go all the way out there because it's tough to do comedy. And so you you start to you condition your brain to think, well, this is how they might be in real life. And then when you sit down with them, like, oh yeah, they're not that way. Whereas Robin is, was like the same, right? Robin Williams or even Jim Carrey, they feel like they're the same person. But with with Jerry, there's such a distinct. Yeah, I don't know though. I don't know though because when a camera's on, you're performing. 
So is that the it's part of who they are and also part of the artifice of what they're creating? Mm. So I don't in any of those instances, I think the like a closer representation of Jim Carrey's go watch the actor roundtable he did for Variety. Mm. And within that, it's just like that's Jim Carrey. He's got gotcha. um he's very serious and introspective yeah. and uh or listen to him talk about his art. Right. He'll still perform and do all those things. That's part of who he is, but I think it's it's you know more well rounded or more faceted. Uh, I'll be I'll be curious Monday because as we're recording this, Mark Marin is releasing his episode with Eddie Murphy on Monday, and I'm going to be curious to hear how that goes. I want to hear how introspective. Yeah, let's see if Eddie, Eddie actually opens up. Series. Yeah, that's I've been I watch all these interviews, Matt, waiting for that like golden oh nugget of opening up, and yeah. he rarely, rarely does it. He, I I think you could subtract rarely from that sentence. <laughs> he doesn't. What he do you know about does. Eddie? Yeah. Just that he's a dad. He loves Diddly his kids. shit. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, don't know anything about him in reality. What makes him tick at all? Whereas any other person that's been famous for that long, unless they're, although he is kind of, uh, he doesn't do interviews all that often. No, he doesn't. So no. certain guys like Al Pacino does not like to do talk shows and all that jazz because he just doesn't enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So he's a dude that I don't feel like I really, but I have a better understanding, I believe, of him than I do Eddie. Well, the funny part is with Pacino, you think he's more of a gregarious, outgoing person, and De Niro is more reserved. Yet De Niro does this shit way more than Al does, putting himself out there, doing interviews, and going on the late night shows, even being on SNL. Right? You've never seen Pacino on SNL, yeah. You know, and that's I find that to be fascinating because you imagine Pacino is you think Pacino is more of a outgoing, extroverted guy, but I guess he just doesn't like doing that shit, man. Yeah, I that's why I just remember him. Uh, saying once long ago that he just he doesn't do talk shows because he just doesn't like talk shows, mm -hmm. which I can't blame him. The it's a completely artificial environment. Yeah. yeah, trying to act like you're having a natural conversation with questions that have been vetted by your people and theirs. <laughs> exactly, it's all what is. Yeah, it's all. That's why I always liked Craig Ferguson. If I watched him, which I I don't really watch many of those anymore, but he would just have a conversation. Oh yeah, those are great. Yeah, those are great. It was more interesting to watch as opposed to the staged. Yeah. Bullshit. That, I, I'm more from that school, the Craig Ferguson school. I, yeah, I don't, it's more fun. Yeah, I don't hunt the clicks or the bait, baity questions. You know, where I, I like to just have conversations when I do the deep cut or any of my other shows where I interview people. It's just like let's have a fucking conversation. You know, if if the big thing comes up, naturally, great. But it doesn't have to be about that because it should be about getting to know the person. You know. And so that's, that's, I, I agree with you, Craig. I go back and watch some of his interviews with people and he is so just chilling out with them. You see, it almost seems like you're, you're not even watching a late night talk show. You're just hanging out with this person and his guest for the night. And it's great. Yeah, it's absolutely great. And I love that fucking robot. Um, all right. Where are we at? It's your six. Uh, that was my six. Okay. So my seven was Dream Girls with Eddie Murphy. Mm -hmm. We got that already. So then my six is Whoopi Goldberg in the color purple. Uh, okay, that was one of the two. I don't know if you heard me say that when you were. Uh, I there were two. I just realized that we're not going to be on my list. Go for it. Color oh, purple. Okay. Yeah, I mean this is a, such a good movie. Still holds up. Um, uh, incredibly uh, difficult to, to moment a uh, film to watch at times. Um, and I'll still and I give Steven Spielberg all the credit. You know he really brought to life. Uh, this Alice Walker novel, and there's a lot of genuinely powerful moments amongst the characters there. You know, I, I don't know the I've never in, in viscerally experienced the black experience in this country, uh, but where it's set, the time that it's set, you sense that there's an authenticity to what Spielberg is directing because of the incredible work being done by everybody involved in the cast Danny Glover, uh, Adolf Caesar, uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey, and Whoopi Goldberg, number one, leading the cast. I mean, we had seen her, I'd seen her do her stand up and stuff, you know, when I was a, in my teenager to think that she had this gear in her was just mind blowing to watch. And she's so um, perfectly cast and heartbreaking. And she goes through that thing like you saw in Excalibur where homie goes from the young, naive king to like this old king at the end. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg goes from the young girl who's being you know, sexually abused by Danny Glover and in a terrible situation 
uh, and shunned by her family and having her sister ripped away from her mm -hmm. all the way to being an older woman um, uh, in control of her life and in her own business and making her own money uh, and all the things she goes through. And Whoopi has, I don't think Whoopi's ever done a performance that comes close to what she did in Color Purple, maybe for lack of opportunities um, or a desire, lack of desire to go to those places again. But sure. For this, uh, I give her all, and she deserved the Oscar for this way more than she did for Ghost. Even though she's great in Ghost, she's doing way more incredible work in Color Purple, and so I get to give yeah. credit. Yeah, it's also the difference of a lead versus supporting. Mm. True, very true. Um, sure. Yeah, I was gonna tell you I, I need to use the restroom, but we can go because we're gonna have some commonality coming up. Mm. That's why I kept putting my finger up. I was trying to not interrupt you, but no. usually say, <laughs> "Can can I interject for one second? Uh, well, if you want to go, go real quick and then I'll, I'll, uh, well, I'll I can, I can kibitz. We're going to have commonality okay. more than likely in this top okay. five. So you can start that discussion whenever we get to it and I can hold off okay. until then. Sounds good. All right. What's your five? Five is uncut gems. Uh, that's a slight punt. Okay. So my five is uh lost in translation, Bill Murray. That is the one that I assume. So is okay. Wow. Okay. I need so to I'll revisit. Go ahead. Oh, okay. You and Pete. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, his work in Lost in Translation, I know there's other ones, Broken Flowers, when this maybe some of the, some uh, maybe people think Rushmore is uh, dramatic more than comedic and some other roles he's done, but it's Lost in Translation that was really the one. You get, you it, once again, it's this idea of feeling like you are spending time, here, let me take Matt out and I'll put him back in. You're spending time with this person. You're spending time with the actual person as they're navigating this uh, city to navigating this world and reacting to the things that are happening in their worlds and reacting to Scarlett Johansson and all that's happening there. And he's also clearly at a career crossroads. What does it mean for him? And Bill Murray was at this time, probably in the same location. The comedies aren't selling on, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an introspective, intelligent guy who's driven uh, to create characters uh, that I feel a connection to whether comedic sensibility or dramatic sensibility. And I'm not, getting those roles and then lost in translation shows up and he absolutely kills it in this role. He is, uh, he is uh, incredible in a way that you've never, you rarely see Bill Murray be. He is touching. He is sensitive. He's uh, vulnerable. He's available to you. Um, and he develops this really great relationship with Scarlett Johansson, who at the time was a young actress kind of building her resume as someone to be taken seriously as a performer herself. So all of it just really works so incredibly well. So I just I always uh, revere him in this role. Even though I don't watch Lost in Translation a lot, the times that I do watch it, it still leaves me um, affected by Bill Murray's performance. So, boom. Um, all right, so what's your four, man? Uh, my four is um, Steve Carell in Foxcatcher. Oh, yeah. That's all you, brother. Go ahead. I struggle between this and the big short. Oh, yeah. It's good in the big short. It's more of an ensemble in the big short, even though I will mo I will guaranteed watch it more times. But to watch him turn into DuPont and Foxcatcher yeah. yeah. and take on this weird <sighs> individual that exists in a mental plane that the rest of us will never be able to identify with because he's always had money. So the rules have been different for him. And it's not like he's had money. He's had stupid, obscene 1% money. Mm -hmm. And he's never had to work a day in his life. And he feels less than, but yet at the same time has an ego of an individual that should be the greatest. Yeah. yeah and it's yeah. this weird push and pull between those things. He wants to prove to his mom that he is a great man and but and live up to the idea of what his name DuPont is but yet yeah. he has no aspirations no drive no goal no purpose mm -hmm. and then eventually finds it misplaces it within sponsoring a wrestling team to go to the yeah. Olympics and then makes himself the the figurehead of this the center of like oh it was his tutelage and his guidance that got these guys there. And they make that, you know, movie within the movie, the documentary about how amazing he is type of thing. Mm -hmm. And just to watch Steve really morph into this individual, uh, it was incredibly impressive. Yeah. 
Uh, anyway, yeah. I just was blown away by it. And the hype around that, I thought was well-deserved. He was excellent to me in the Foxcatcher. Now, how many times am I going to go back and rewatch it? I don't know, but it's a, it's a yeah. role and performance that has stuck with me. And still, I can still visualize numerous aspects of it, uh, just how moving it was in the theater. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I remember, I, I'll probably never watch Foxcatcher again. Um, I, I think the film didn't quite, you know, hit all the marks it was aiming for, but I think, or targets it was aiming for, but overall, certainly his performance is damn good, but it's not a performance I that resonated with me, you know what I'm okay. saying? And, and so that's why I didn't get, but I, it's on my side list for sure. But it's not one that I necessarily, you know, run back to to watch or watch scenes of or enjoy. Yeah, it's uh, understandable in that way, but yeah, but because he's not a nice guy, he's not a good guy to like, and of course that's the whole point. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And uh, if you watch the documentary that they did, I think on HBO or whatever, or the Thirty for Thirty, it is unsettling how close Corell came to bringing this guy to life. Like it really is. You can see how how um, much work Corell did to bring out the reality of this dude when you watch the actual dude in these interviews. Um, and it's a tough film, dude. I mean, it's a tragic, tragic movie yeah. in so many ways. And the fact um, that it's a true story is, yeah. He even makes more, it yeah, even more palpable. I see. Don't fuck with the rich, man. Don't fuck with the rich. They don't see the world the way us normal people do, man. Just, what his level of wealth, old wealth, especially old. Wealth. Yeah. It just, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, it's like there's a documentary made by a rich kid from New York about other rich kids that grew up in the same environment where their parents are just part of that upper tier. And it is fascinating to watch these people struggle to find purpose and meaning. Yeah. When they have anything they want. So then, you know, like his dad gets into collecting and he's like, you need to find a hobby of some sort of collection of your own and something that will accrue value. Get into, I think it was maps that he was into or he was trying maps. to get his son wow. into. Yeah, okay. like antique maps. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, but it, when you have all the money in the world, like, yeah. what do you do? What's your motivation? Yeah. Can you what, find it? Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, anyway, so that was my four. Okay. Uh, so then my four is the punt from earlier, Melissa McCarthy, Can You Ever Forgive Me? Wow, four. Yeah, dude. I, I got to say, I I did not expect this from her, man. I mean, I know she's got those moments in other films, um, like in Bridesmaids, where she has that really kind of poignant moment with uh, with Kristen Wiig and other things she's she done. But to, to me, she's just been you know, Snooky and Gilmore Girls in the kitchen and then a couple other things that were just funny stuff. Okay. But I didn't expect something like this because it's it's not that she's not just that she's good in this role. It's the way she makes someone who you should not have any business liking because she is a crook and a thief and a criminal and, and doesn't stop herself when she should. You don't want to have sympathy for this person normally. But Melissa McCarthy does such excellent work giving her so many layers that when you're seeing these moments happen, you can't help but root for her in spite of yourself. Do you know what I'm saying? And sure. Richard E. Grant is doing his thing because always Richard E. Grant does the showy stuff. But what she's doing is the more grounded, um, foundational shit of the movie. And she carries it in a number of scenes. Uh, and like I said, I, I was predisposed from the trailer not to like this person. Yet I found myself by the end kind of, you know, feeling a little sympathy for her. And yeah. it's a true story as well. And I think Melissa doesn't cop out in doing little comedic moments using her tricks. None of her stuff is there that you've seen in other films. And I thought that was very impressive. So impressive that I, uh, I put her this high, you know, yeah. which surprised me, to be honest with you. Yeah. I almost put on St. Vincent instead of this. No, oh, St. Vincent's a good choice, too. Uh, her part is just much smaller. That's yeah. that was I was thinking about doing a combo of her and Murray because I didn't have Murray for Lost in Translation. Right, right. And that's just because I need to see it again. Mm -hmm. Um, the hype was too great going into it the first time. Mm -hmm. Uh yeah, I liked her. Richard A. Grant steals every scene that he's in. Yeah, totally. Like he always does, like he always fucking does. Man. But it's like it's perfect casting. He is mm -hmm. because she has to pay, play this like frumpy dour type of individual who's almost a shut in 
and she needs money. And that's why she gets into this forgery business Yeah, to have this person come in and be like a spark of life because she's basically, you know, to some extent kind of Eeyore ish. Yeah. Uh, so it's easier for him to shine as much. And I think had her part been larger in St. Vincent, I, a, I would, a, I would have put that on and B probably would have vaulted it higher than number nine on my list. Mm. Uh, which I enjoyed this movie. I just wasn't blown away, but I think she, I enjoy her more in, in dramas than I do in comedies. That's oh, okay. All right. I do. I think that's fair. And it's nothing. It just comedy is very subjective and whether or not it hits on your tastes and she's excellent at what she does. I'm not saying she's a bad comedic actor. Right. She's right. awesome. It's just not my, it doesn't make me laugh, but yeah. at the same time, uh, not many do. Right. Uh, like Kevin Hart is a, big one that people love and i i don't know that i ever really laugh at kevin hart yeah i know a lot of people a lot of love people love him but a lot of people but there's enough people on the other side are like i don't get it i don't get it well, it's not that i don't get it just like it doesn't what he does to get a laugh doesn't elicit laughter from me that's mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. it's nothing against him i you can see that the dude is wildly talented yeah absolutely but yeah just certain things triggered you know some people love emo phillips i've never oh. I don't get it. Oh God! But I it's not for me. A thousand percent. Yeah, but there are some people that think that he is the greatest comedian of all time. Yes. You know, comedy is exceedingly subjective. It really is. I've yeah. never understood the emotions, and I probably never no. will. There's a whole bunch oh. of them. They're like, "Oh, that dude's an all timer," or "She's one of the best ever," and just like, "Okay, yeah. you know, teach their own." True. Um. All right. So that was my four. What's your three? Uh, my three is the man that should have won the Oscar. Hey, uh, Michael Keaton in Birdman. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Go ahead. What? You don't? No, I don't consider him a comedic actor, but I totally respect the fact that. Really? Uh, I, I don't because of, because I mean, then Tom Hanks is in this category at that point because like he. Ah, uh, well, he started as a... and comedies at the same time. Yeah, but he started as a stand up. Okay. And then everything that I knew of him as a kid was right. Mr. Mom, Gung Ho, Beetlejuice, Night Shift. Like it is comedy, 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 comedy. And I knew he was a stand up comic before that to then be able to pull off something like you have Spotlight Birdman. Like you're right, Tom Hanks, you could. Yeah. But I've always known the backstory of Keaton is like he did stand up for a little while and then got into. And I love those movies as a kid. And then to see his resurgence all these years later. Uh, and there's no way that no person can legitimately tell me that Eddie Redmayne was better in the theory of everything. Yeah, I, I agree with you a thousand percent, actually. Yeah, it's just there's no. And I think the clip of him at the Oscars, Keaton, when he thinks his name's about to be called and he has to put his speech back in his inside pocket. <laughs> Cause he's reaching for it to stand up and he has to like sit back down and push it down. I agreed with him. I was like, and are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. Redman was good. Yeah. But this, this is another Rami Malik situation where it's like, why is this dude getting it for, although I think theory of everything is a better movie overall than I agree. Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, but yeah, Birdman, I just, oh man, I loved it coming out of the theater. I still think it's magic for me. Right. Uh, and him playing a version of himself, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of a former action star. And then what is he now if he's not the identity of that? And I love that he's had this resurgence. Keaton has, mm -hmm. because now he can do things like uh, uh, call himself Batman. Yeah. And it's not, we only know you as Batman. It's like, now you've done, you've been working again. So it's totally cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I Keaton had a bunch down there, but you're right though. Tom Hanks fits I mean, a lot of that definition as well. I know. So I, I struggled with Hanks because I was gonna put it on the list, but I'm like, this is such I can't because yes, bosom buddies, yes, splash, yes, you know, man with one red shoe. There's big even all the way to big. It is until he makes that turn in the late '80s, '90s, he starts doing drama all across the board that it, he walks away from the comp so much so that people still say. They want him to come back and do a full on comedy yeah. again. And he never has. That's uh, lighthearted stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But 
definitely a comedian. I didn't know if he was a stand-up or anything like that, but certainly his comedic uh, chops were there from the beginning uh, as well. Same yeah. thing with like Jonah Hill. Like I don't have Jonah Hill on my list. And maybe I struggled you with that. No, but I, struggled I was like, with... yeah. I'm yeah. Like, yeah. Even in his comedies, he always had a more dramatic approach to the roles. So to me, I don't see him as a comedic actor necessarily. Yeah, to me, he's John C. Riley. You do both. Mm, right, you do both. Yes, and you you're do both at both. Yeah, yeah. You're not just a comedic actor at this point. Yeah. Um. So yeah. okay. So then my number three, um, and that's a great choice, Matt. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna. I mean, you're right. Michael Keaton started at Mr. Mom, Johnny Dangerously, all that shit, or uh, Night Shift, all of Gung Ho. But mm -hmm. I, I grew up at a, you know, because I'm older than you. I saw Clean and Sober. I saw these other films where he was trying to break out of that uh and so um to me it seemed like he was doing both at the same time and mm -hmm. then batman shows up and you're like oh shit so uh, but it's a yeah, fair one right. to put up there it's a totally fair one to, to put up there man um so what do you got next yeah my uh three is uh, adam sandler and uncut gems okay yeah oh I, what no no it was a punt from earlier oh cool that's right where what did you have it again uh, i want to say five okay Okay. Yeah, five. Yeah, sorry, I said that. A slight punch. You're right. Um, yeah, this this is one that just I can't look. My girlfriend hates this fucking movie. She left the room, but I will go back and watch scenes of this movie. He is so excellent in this film. Yeah, it drives me insane. Look, Punch Drunk Love would have made the list, maybe a little bit sh uh, lower on the list, but Uncut Gems, he is excellent in this fucking movie and just takes you on this crazy journey and you believe him and you're frustrated by him and that ending holy shit so yeah. just throughout what he's able to balance the scenes he's able to have with uh, i think adina menzel plays his wife and then you know his uh, mistress julia fox and then all the stuff with his kids and then the, the the jewish side of things that he's struggling with at the same time that he's got these gambling habit and the way he presents this character Normally, dude, somebody could take this character and you you couldn't give two shits about him, but uh, Sandler it gives so much life to this character that you are invested in mm -hmm. his uh, journey, even though he's making all these fucking moves that are wrong. Uh, and I just I just think he's magnetic throughout the whole movie. I, I took it over Punch Drunk because Punch Drunk, my favorite scene is Philip Seymour Hoffman's. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. When he's trying to act tough, and then when once Sandler stands up to him and to watch him back, that's my favorite scene yeah. in that movie. Agreed. Whereas uncut, it's all it. The my favorite scenes are Sandler centric, mm -hmm. uh, and it's yeah. If this didn't exist, then Punch Drunk would have made my list. Yeah, agreed. Same here. Same. And here. The, I, I it looks like you did the same thing. I limited it to one per actor or actress. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh. It's the one that stands out. That's what I limited to. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't know he had this gear. Yes. Right. Whereas Punch Drunk, kind of uh, not saying that I didn't know he had that gear, but to right. play like a quiet kind of person that could be prone to uh, emotional outbursts and whatnot seems closer to a person that he could have been, possibly, type of yeah. thing. Whereas uncut, it's I don't know, it's unlike anything that I've seen him do. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't watched everything he's done, but the rest has been a lot of kids' movies, so it's not yeah. like he's come close to this. Uh, and yeah, just this slimy guy that you kind of want to root for, and he's got a, you know, side girls and an apartment in the city, yeah. and but he's got a family and kids, and this weird push and pull with his family, and you know what he does for a living. I, the movie as a whole is is really good. I don't think he deserved to win the Oscar. Yeah. A lot of people felt like even Daniel day Lewis apparently reached out to him and said, you deserve the Oscar, which is insane. Uh, yeah. I thought part of the nomination completely deserved mm -hmm. to win it. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, that's fair. But, uh, I, it seemed as though unlike Eddie, he'll more than likely revisit this. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Sooner rather than later. Yeah, there's no way the Safety brothers don't have something else lined up for him that'll get him even closer to the to a possible Oscar. So mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's ironic because I also feel like people are moving away from giving that award the importance it used to have. I mean, no, I mean the Golden Globes ratings were for shit. And so I just think this is 
I think this is a trend that's happening amongst a lot of people who watch yeah. movies now and the younger gener generation, especially that they don't, they see these awards. They don't revere these awards like they used to. And, I think know. they do. I just don't think the ceremony, the ceremony is like three and a half hours. Who mm -hmm. wants to sit down and watch this three and a half hour pat on the back? Yeah. Well, maybe. I mean, once someone pointed out to me that it, the Oscars are no different than a car dealership giving out salesman of the year awards. And you're like, yeah, it is an industry congratulating itself. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. like, yeah, yeah, that's true. I hadn't thought about that, well, but we all have an opinion. And I think that's the difference of the Oscars. No one gives a shit who wins the golden globes. Whereas yeah, yeah. I, I still care who wins best picture, best actor, director, actress, mm. you know, that still has resonance with me. And I think it does for any real movie lover. Yeah. But that's fair. BAFTAs I've never cared about golden globes. Like any of the rest of it is just nonsense to me. Yeah. Uh, all right. So where are we at? Uh, your two? Yeah. My deuce is Goodwill Hunting, Rob Williams. Same as mine. Yeah. And I, I think we have the same number one then. Oh, I hope so. Uh, yeah. I think we can barrel right through both okay. of them. Okay. Sure. Sounds good. And so yeah. Just because Goodwill, what can we say? Right. If you haven't seen it, for God's sakes, watch yeah, it. Haven't. Just to see his performance. Yeah. And number right. one, uh, Jim Carrey and yep. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless yep. Mind. Absolutely. Number one as well. Yeah. yeah. Because we had seen him do schmaltzy, like majestic. Yeah. And Truman Show, uh, I'm not the biggest fan of. I think it it's doesn't fine. quite get there. I agree. It doesn't quite get there. But Eternal Sunshine, he gets there and the film gets there. Yeah. Well, holding his own with Kate Winslet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And not to say that he's not a good actor, but this is her domain, not his. Right. Right. Good point, Matt. Yeah. Whereas if she was in a comedy with him, you'd like, be saying the same thing that I do, at least about Jeff Daniels and Dumb and Dumber. Like, Holding his own. It's yeah. really hard to do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's, I mean, top to bottom, it is It is his movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is a 1B, but it's his yeah. journey that we're following as we go through this. And uh, yeah. it, it, I wish he would do this more. I agree with you, man. I mean, he tried with like number 23 and these other ones, but nah. you have to find the right... How can I say this? You have to find the right role that that really brings out what he can be. And um, this role really does because, you know, he's a guy who was riding high at the top of the world. Certainly someone that when you say his name, people immediately have 100 different feelings about him uh, and want to see him do comedy. But to see him play like a guy that is, you know, stumbling around and angry about this end of the relationship and trying to figure out how to move on and under not figuring out like, why does this girl, you know, why am I having these weird connections? Who is Elijah Wood? Why is he asking these? So it's all, and then you're re-exploring his relationship at the same time he's rediscovering his relationship again. It's a fascinating film. And so to see him bring all the different and appropriate levels throughout the movie, he's the best part of the film. Like to me, I could care less about the, uh, the Kirsten Dunst. Like I, I get yeah, it's a terrible B story. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's obviously a terrible thing that, uh, that Tom Wilkinson does yeah. to her and everything like that. So I, I get that thing, but it's the Jim Carrey, Kate Winslet chemistry and connection that I follow throughout the movie. It's because Jim really kind of surrenders himself to the situation and appropriately has his moments of frustration and his moments of, you know, let me keep this. Let me have this. His yeah. desperate desire to 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 understand he's made a mistake here. You know, so it's brilliant. Uh, so there we go. All right, that's our list. Uh, now we're gonna put this thing together and give you the official uh, top ten list of uh, dramatic performances from comedic actors. And then we'll do um, David Akers once we're yeah. done with this. We'll hear DMB's list as well. That's so all. First two are done. Mm -hmm. Ross is rosining up the drums here. Uh, so I would say then Adam Sandler goes three. Oh yeah, with because of uh, it's at five for you. Yeah, five. Okay. And then uh, McCarthy is four nine. Yeah. Um, and then Jerry Lewis is six. Eight? Ten. Six, ten. Hmm. So four, nine would be six, ten. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, would you give me Keaton and Birdman at four, and then we'll do those two? Um, 
Yeah, sure. That's fine. And then I'll take Bill Murray at, after that for loss in translation. Well, that would be, hold on, we'll get to one second. All right, so I have my four mm-hmm. in Steve Carell and Foxcatcher. And you have your five? What was your, what, what was Birdman, three? Three. Okay. Yeah. So you've got right. uh, Steve, Foxcatcher, Bill. Okay. We have nine and ten have, left to fill. Don't we have Eddie Murphy and Dreamgirls? Uh, yes, we do. Oh, what number was that for you? My eight. Okay, that was my seven. So that should be next, right? Yeah. That'll okay. make nine. So we have one left. Where's King of Comedy? We moved Our it higher numbers. up. Okay. Yeah. So we have one left. Um, my next highest is six. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg in color purple. All right. Whoopi Goldberg it is. Nice. All right. Here we go. The top 10 dramatic performances from comedic actors. Yeah. At number 10. Whoopi Goldberg in The Color Purple. At number 9. Eddie Murphy in Dreamgirls. At number 8. Bill Murray, Lost in Translation. At number 7. Steve Carell, Foxcatcher. At number 6. Jerry Lewis, The King of Comedy. At number 5. Melissa McCarthy, Can You Ever Forgive Me? At number four, Michael Keaton and Birdman. At number three, Adam Sandler and Uncut Gems. At number two, Robin Williams and Goodwill Hunting. And our number one dramatic performance from a comedic actor is Jim Carrey in Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Hey, still works. Still a great performance, for God's sakes. Um. Uh, all right, that's the list. That's the official list here from the top 10 show. Um, Matt, what do we want to tell him? Well, we got uh, David Mitchell Baker's list. Yeah, let's get it. And he says, hi, guys. Thanks, for, as always, for choosing my topic. Uh, there have been so many fantastic, dramatic performances from comedic actors over the years, some of them being among my all-time favorite performances, that narrowing down to 10 and choosing one role per actor was tough to do. Anyways, thanks again, and hope you enjoyed discussing the topic at 10. He's got Melissa McCarthy and Can You Ever Forgive Me? Wow, 10. Okay. Nine is Jason Siegel in The End of Tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, eight, that was on my side list. Eight, Robin Williams, Good Will Hunting. Eight. Seven, Michael Keaton and Birdman. Mm. Six, Jack Black and Bernie. Uh, it's a good movie. Nice choice. Five, Catherine Hahn and Private Life. Oh, yeah. Oh, four, she's good in that. Oh, I saw that. All right. Phil, four, Bill Murray, Lost in Translation. Mm-hmm. Three, Mary Tyler Moore, Ordinary People. Mm. Two, Jim Carrey, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And number yeah. one is Adam Sandler, Punch Drunk Love. Wow. So there is no Robin Williams? Is that Or is that lower oh, on the list? He was number eight. Eight. Wow. Okay. All right. Good list, DMB. I respect your points of view. I like you sliding in Mary Tyler people not a lot of people have seen that movie nowadays so uh much love to you for sending that in uh yeah and thank you so much great topic we loved it and it was uh it's one of those can't believe we haven't done before type of things yeah yeah so thank you uh david we uh we thoroughly appreciate it and if you'd like to submit a topic or be a part of anything that we do head over to patreon.com forward slash the top 10 with the number 10 and you can join this is the boss hog tier where you get access to this but at five dollars and above you get to participate in uh, topic thunder and uh, get a shout out once a month yep. uh we also you know uh we got the live shows coming up we, we try and uh, create all kinds of different content specifically for you guys as a thank you for supporting us so once again head over to patreon.com forward slash the top 10 with the number 10 yep the ten dollars and above get to uh, see, as, as Matt was talking about, our live shows ahead of time. They get to be there live as we record our show. Everyone else gets it that following Tuesday, but you all get to come in on that Thursday and hang out with us and send in your thoughts as we create the list. So you get to watch the show and then chime in uh, as you normally would do while you're driving down the road or running or walking or hiking or taking a bath or uh, having sex even listening to us and getting mad at some of our choices. You can get mad in live time 
as we record it. And that will be part of the YouTube show when we drop it on Tuesday. So that's another perk you get as a $10 and above patron of the top 10. And to the gentleman that listens to our show in the bathtub, if you are watching along, let us know if you're in the bathtub. Yeah. Because yeah. I'd like to know if there's live cock and ball floating around somewhere. Oh, Lordy. As we're talking. It's a lot of fun. Uh, All right. You can follow me anywhere at Matt Nose. Check out Settle the Score and uh, Dropping Dimes, the two other podcasts I do. And that is it for me this week. There we go. Please follow me at The Roca Says on Twitter and on Instagram. And please come on over to my uh, YouTube channel as well, youtube.com slash John Roca Says. Got a lot of stuff going on there. We, we're killing it with these WandaVision reviews with Emma Five. So if you're just catching up to that show or, or, or you know, coming in a little bit later, want to hear another points of views, Come and uh, watch those uh, reviews as well over there. And don't forget the Top 10 has a YouTube channel as well. For those of you who may not be watching it on the temp uh, on the YouTube channel, you're just listening to us on a podcast feed, go on over to the YouTube channel as well. Watch our uh, pretty faces talking about all the things we do there. Catch up on the Golden Ticket as well. You can go back and watch all those episodes on the YouTube channel and uh, follow the journey again. All right, that's it. Take care of yourselves. Be well. Uh, wear your masks. Practice social distancing. And we'll talk to you next time another brand new episode of the Top 10 Show. Peace.